to go I'm gonna leave here running cause walking's much too slow I'm going back to the bottle where I'm better known cause you haven't done nothing but drove our good man away from home Give me one, one, one more kiss, mama Just before I go Gonna leave this town And I, I won't be back no more Yeah, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania And I was lucky to be in Pennsylvania and I lived there till I was 14 and uh, grew up on a little gentleman's farm. I had three brothers, four boys, and we had a horse pasture and a swimming pool and a baseball field. And we had a man named Caleb who really uh, looked after the whole family while well, my father was always busy working. And we grew up going to school, living on the farm, and uh, we got into music at a young age. My brother brought bluegrass to all of us. And we played in a, we called ourselves We Are All Brothers Bluegrass Band. We are all brothers. And we were all brothers. And that's how I started in music. I used to go to campgrounds in Martha's Vineyard and entertain people at campgrounds because they're, they're captive audiences, you know. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you please welcome back in hand, Gary Shane and Steve Cole. <laughs> I got good at performing as I got older. By the time I was 18, uh, I went to boarding school in Colorado Springs. Uh, my dad went there too. It was a family tradition, really. And then I got kicked out, being stupid. And then I came to back to New York, where my folks lived. And then uh, I decided to hitchhike across the country after I got kicked out of high school. And that's where I met Tom Buzzard in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, I met Jesus on the, on the highway. I met Jesus and found a relationship with the Lord. Boy, was I lucky to have that experience. But then I... Uh, I started going to college. I went to St. Louis, Missouri first to get some music theory so I could go into Berkeley College of Music. And I went to Berkeley College of Music for three years. After I got out of St. Louis, Missouri, Webster College, I transferred to Berkeley College. And I did two and a half years at Berkeley and I quit. After they told me me trying to write a song was like a three-year-old trying to write a book. So I got really mad and I went and quit school the next day. Then later on I realized they were right. You know, I was like a three-year-old. I do write like a three-year-old. All my songs are really simple. <laughs> so they weren't really wrong, but they did make me mad. And I quit school. But then I joined rock and roll bands and I think my first hit song was 1975 or seven. Uh, stepped on in the feeling where my my radio airplay songs started me in my radio airplay career in the early 70s and by 79 Shadow World went to number one on the radio and that was a big hit for me and a, a big feeling of success to get 
the recognition. And that recognition brought me uh, on stages with Aerosmith, Cheap Trick, Nick Lowe, all sorts of different people I shared the stage with. I never went national though. I was just a Boston guy, you know. Your words can tell lies. Your eyes can hide what's inside. Words just speak so. When I finally got airplay, things started changing. And I got airplay by being consistent and persistent. And I just wrote songs all the time. And I kept going to radio stations to give them copies on reel to reel tapes back then. And finally, we got airplay for local stations like ERS and WFBR, little stations in Boston, Cambridge, little college stations. big stations like BCN, COZ, and FNX, and they started playing me, I was off and running. And I got the gigs because I got the airplay, I got kind of famous because I got the airplay and I got the gigs, but I still couldn't get a record deal. I don't know why, but it never happened. Not like other people who got record deals after one hit song. I had a number of hit songs on the radio. MS didn't really kick in until uh, the first episode was 85 and uh, I got diagnosed as MS after I told the doctor I had MS because a friend of mine had MS and she, when she heard my symptoms, she said, you got MS, Gary, because they were the same as hers. Started with vision problems and then spasticity and mobility issues. So I got diagnosed in 1985, officially having MS, from a spinal tap, which I don't wish on anybody. But that's the way they find out for sure. First they do an MRI, and then a spinal tap. Um, So once I found out I had MS, I still didn't have that much symptoms. But I knew I had something that was potentially pretty debilitating. It's degenerative, it's not fatal though. And uh, by the time I went to Athens, Greece in 95, I had tried a few drugs that the FDA approved. And the side effects were, when I found out one of the side effects was suicide, I thought it. The heck with this. I'm not doing this drug anymore. 
Then I read the doctor's little newspaper article on how he had 95% success rate, no side effects. I was sold right away. And I went over to Athens to try Dr. Contouris' chemotherapy, IVIG, which is blood plasma, and steroids in low dosages. That was the key. So low that they didn't give me side effects. So that was amazing that the doctor found this method and that he wasn't more famous and people didn't hear about him. As a matter of fact, I only found him because I called the newspaper that wrote the article on him. I called Reuters News. I couldn't find him. And the MS Society couldn't find him. And they all said, oh, well, we heard of him, but we haven't been able to find him. So finally, I wake up, I go, well, this is, this is ridiculous. It's called the Reuters News in Athens. And I said, have you ever heard of this Dr. Contouris fellow? And he goes, oh, yeah, I saw him yesterday. And I said, you saw him yesterday? Oh, yeah, he's curing people. So he had this reputation for curing people coming in wheelchairs and walking out on their own. Amazing. So I had to go. So I got on a plane and I went to Athens, Greece, not knowing any Greek or anything about the doctor or what he was going to do. I remember thinking to myself on the plane, am I really going to <laughs> let them put IV needles in me? I'm not into IVs at all. And as soon as I got there, he put an IV in me. <laughs> that was the funny part. Theo uh, made fun of me. <laughs> IVs. Two, twice a day. Once in the morning, once in the at late afternoon. A new needle every time, too. Now, what was in the IVs? Steroids, IVIG, and blood uh, chemotherapy in low dosages. And the chemo was blue. The IVIG was taped and taped so it couldn't get affected by light. The steroid was clear. So it was either a clear bottle or a tape bottle or a blue bottle, you know, every day, seven days a week. I had no idea what it was. I don't know why I trusted the Greek doctor so much. He just, there were so many other patients there with MS. I believed it was going to help. And it did. After a month, I was walking without my cane. That was amazing. After only a month to walk without my cane. I'd like to have that happen again. That was because of Theo and his physical therapy. Electronic muscle stimulus. Hmm. Can you tell uh, me a little bit about the... Um, you said there was another therapy that you did, aromatherapy, and what, what oh, that flower, detail? flower essence therapy. Uh, it was a remarkable um, flower essence is a, a remarkable flower, Bach flower essences. Uh, Marina Angeli said to me one day, I, Dr. Contouris tells me not to tell patients about this alternative treatment. And Dr. Contouris walked in and said, no alternative for him. And then there she was whispering to me, telling me about this alternative flower essence. And I, I got a little bottle of it and I just put it on my tongue as much as I wanted. And it helped with my uh, attitude and my acceptance. That was amazing. Amazing. To run into Dr. Contouris, Theo, the physical therapist, and Marina Angeli, the flower therapist, all three doctors in the same office. It was pretty uncanny. But it was also strange because the language barrier, everybody spoke Greek and I spoke English and they spoke enough English so we could get our, our messages across, but it still was uh, not really that good communication. But the message was to help you get well. Yeah, I felt like we were on the road especially when I started walking after the first month. And then by the end of the second month, I was feeling really good until I came down with some kind of flu. And it set me back. I had to go back to my cane and then back to the wheelchair. 
So everything got reversed. So to experience such a high and then such a low, it was mind blowing. I know it happened, but tough to know now when you see me in the scooter chair and you know I'm not really that mobile anymore. And it disappeared, dissipated. And I can't go back because I did enough of the chemotherapy for a lifetime, lifetime maximum dosages. That's what I had. And what is the reason that uh, the treatment over there can't be done here? Is there, uh, it's, it's just not approved? Is that what's happening? Well, the, the treatment was Dr. Contouris' protocol. Dr. Contouris was not willing to share his protocol with anybody because it was his protocol. He would tell my doctor he was doing chemotherapy, tell my doctor he was doing IVIG, and tell my doctor he was doing steroids, but it, he wouldn't tell him what dosage. He was doing very small dosages, so there were no side effects. So that was pretty clever. But he couldn't really explain what his method was for deciding how much to give me. And was I the same as everybody else in the room? Because everybody was getting the same thing, but I was getting it. Sometimes he'd do three days in a row. Sometimes he'd do four days in a row. Other times he'd do one day. And then, you know, the rest of the time I'd have to hang around Athens and enjoy the different things about the city I loved. Certain restaurants, some of the shopkeepers, they got to know me. They, and the, some of the, the friendships I created were just wonderful. And then I went, went back in 99 and, and 2005, and the same people were there. So that was fun. That was great. But I couldn't do the chemotherapy anymore because I had lifetime maximum dosages. So I, I didn't want to have the risk of heart problems. So I had to stop chemotherapy. Now, the first time you left to go over to Greece, how hard was that for you to, to leave your family? And did they understand what was going on? They didn't really understand what was going on. And I only knew about it from the newspaper article my mother found about Dr. Contouris and his 95% success rate. But when I was trying different things, I tried bee venom therapy. I was trying beta seron, the interferon, doing injecting myself. I, I, got really depressing. Yeah, it was bad because my wife and I had hit the skids and that was a drag. While I was gone, she was the secretary at my office and I was the manager at the office. So I was getting, sending her faxes from Athens with instructions about what to do with the, all the people that worked in the office, you know. I was trying to carry on both activities, you know. And plus I did the music over there, so I had this tape of all the songs. I was just playing it. It was too crazy, crazy time. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, when you realized that once you were there and you were getting treatment that this is not as crazy as it may seem and actually this may work. Did you ever have that feeling at one point? Yeah, I was thinking to myself, oh my God, I've, I found some, I found a cure. No one else in the country knows about this treatment and they don't have any cure in the USA. So I felt like I was on top of the world because I came back ready to walk, but I couldn't because I got that flu on the last weekend. Literally on the last weekend I was there and it knocked me back. So I don't know what to say because it didn't last. The, uh, and the doctor gave me 14 bottles to bring home to keep doing it. 
but I couldn't find anybody to put the IV in. I was too scared to put the IV in myself, you know. I didn't have the nerve to put my own IV needle in my arm. I wish I did. I could have done the rest of that medicine. I ended up throwing it away. And I went back to Athens in 99. And he gave me some more, but it wasn't the same. But I, I think it stopped my digression. It was on, I was on a downhill ride that was pretty much halted by the chemotherapy. That was the good part. Halted the digression. Halted my digression. Hmm. Now how supportive is your family with all this? It was tough with my kids. It was tough with my wife. and My wife ended up divorcing me and we got divorced and the kids were angry and and uh, they carried on and I went on my way. I went through four or five houses since then, you know. Got into some pretty wild <laughs> real estate deals. Did some, a lot of manipulating and came back to the real estate office and carried on until, oh, I think it was 9-11 was sort of the turning point for my real estate career. Um, started going downhill. And the band really kind of went downhill in 99, 2000. So now I'm thinking just make this movie and that's all I'm going to have. <laughs> Carry on a legacy. Legacy.